This morning's reading is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Thanksgiving and prayer. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Amen. So thank you, Martin, and thank you, Janice. So the last few weeks, uh, we've been looking at the subject of prayer and for those that, are, that, those that are here with us regularly, um, we've had lots of different people uh, speaking, some barn members. And David started us off back at the beginning of January with Nehemiah's prayer and the four pillars of prayer, ACTS, we know the acronym ACTS, adoration, confession, thanksgiving and supplication, prayers for ourselves and others. <clears throat> Excuse me. And David also mentioned this last week, in his, uh, when he was talking about the prayer of Hezekiah and we learn that we can trust God when we are in difficult situations. We can be completely dependent on him. So all the glory goes to him. As we draw near to God, God will draw near to us. And Linda spoke about different ways to pray on our own in a group, praying in the spirit with humility, aware of who God is, in faith according to his will and with perseverance. And Andrew spoke about unanswered prayer. Where is God when we need him and our prayers go unanswered? We need to remember the words in 1 Corinthians, sorry, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9 where God says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And I have an apology to Heather and Fiona and Linda, because I wasn't able to see what you did. I wasn't here on the, on the first all-age service of the year. Um, but I believe that you um, spoke on the Lord's Prayer. And I'm sure that uh, there was lots of different things happening that day. So um, I'm, I'm sure everybody was blessed with that, um, that service. Um, and Jenny last week spoke about, no, two weeks ago, sorry, Jenny, spoke about praise and prayer and how praise redirects our focus from our situation to God's promises. As we, praise God's, as we praise God's name, his name is praised, and it is a blessing to him. And praise is a weapon. When we praise, the enemy flees, and things start to happen. It can be a sacrifice to praise God, despite our circumstances, but God honours that. And so I have a question for you today. Do you have prayers that you remember? Prayers that stick in your mind. Are there certain prayers that, come, that you have in your memory, maybe from childhood or more recently? So I grew up in a family where we didn't pray very much. Uh, in fact, I don't even remember as a family praying other than saying grace at the dinner table. But I remember doing the Alpha course uh, a long time ago, 20, oh, I don't know how many, probably 25 years ago. And at week five, it says, why and how do I pray? And I remember sitting in the group and we are, were encouraged to pray even just one line or, or two lines. 
<clears throat> and I can remember thinking how easy it was. And I can remember thinking how important it was. It's one of the ways of communicating with God and him communicating with us. And it's so important for it to be a two-way thing. And I think Linda spoke about this. We wouldn't go to the doctor and tell him why we were there and, you know, all, of, all out on the table and then get up and say, it was nice talking to you and leave. We would wait to hear what he had to say. And we wouldn't go out for coffee with a friend. Well, maybe we might go out for a coffee with a friend and just talk and talk and talk at them and say it was lovely to spend time with you and leave. It wouldn't be much fun for the other person if we were doing that. And so we can see that it's important for the communication to be two-way. We, we need to wait to hear what God's got to say. We talk to God in prayer, but do we listen to what he has to say, really listen and really hear him. I know sometimes for me it can be a challenge. So what prayers do you remember? Maybe your parents or a sibling or your pastor or elders in the church. And I can remember way back when I was in church, the elders praying and thinking, goodness, that's going on forever and ever and ever. And praying for several minutes sometimes can feel like an eternity when you're a child. And um, I, have friends who's, I have friends whose son, his favorite prayer is, God, help me with the things I need help with. And I just love that prayer. It's so simple, but powerful. And when I lived in Duns, I had a friend called Anne Hartley. She was a lady that worked in the bank with Andrew. And she just appeared on the doorstep one day, not long after we arrived. And um, <clears throat> it felt like I'd known her all my life. Um, she was just um, a lovely Christian lady who just shone and she was so different to other Christians that I'd known before but um, when she prayed it was like God was in the room like she was just having a conversation with him it made my heart feel something and prayer is supposed to be real prayer is talking to God but also it's listening to him it's pouring our hearts out to God you just need to read some of the Psalms to know how uh, David and the other writers felt when they were praying to God. And I can remember the first time as I was in Romania in 2013 and uh, praying with one of the mums there and saying to her, well, what does prayer look like for you? Because I knew what prayer looked like for me. And her experience was the priest praying in church, so her going to church and the priest praying. And I said to her, well, when I pray, when I like to pray, I mean right here and right now, and I think she was a bit kind of, she didn't run away anyway, so that was a good thing. Talking to God, bringing her situation to God and feeling moved by his presence, it was such a humbling experience for me and for her, and the start of what would be a journey of exploring faith together over many years. Anyway, we get today we get to eavesdrop on a prayer, we get to listen in to the Apostle Paul, and what he tells the church at Ephesus, what he prays for them. This prayer isn't what you might normally expect from a prayer. Although they live in a climate, a, a, a culture hostile to Christianity. Paul doesn't pray for God to protect them. Although some of them may be sick or poor. Paul doesn't pray for healing or financial stability. And although some of them may be wrestling with sadness or hurts. Paul doesn't pray for happiness for them. What Paul prays for is so much deeper than my normal prayers, and maybe yours too. I hope today's prayer will serve as a model for the way you pray this coming week. It's already challenged my prayers. So what Paul prays for the Ephesians, I want to also pray for us today. <clears throat> this is my prayer for you. Ephesians 15, sorry, Ephesians 1, 15 to 16 says... For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Paul hears how well the church is doing in Ephesus, that they're loving Jesus and loving each other. And it so moves him that he can't stop thanking God and praying for them. Why is that? It's because Paul knows this church. Paul preached in Ephesus and pastored them for several years. 
starting in Acts 19. At Ephesus, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Acts 19.11, if Paul touched a handkerchief or an apron and those things were taken to the sick, they were cured of their diseases and evil spirits left them. But despite all this, the new believers at Ephesus had had a, hand, had a hard time giving up some of the witchcraft they'd come to trust. The temple of Artemis was built in this city and it dominated the religious life. This is a model of the temple. It was so big and so grand that it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So this tiny group of Christians is trying to follow Jesus in a city ruled by a foreign religion. And so you can see how they might struggle to completely believe. That changed when some men called seven sons of Sceva tried to cast out a demon in the name of Jesus and Paul, but they didn't actually believe. The demon said, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? And then he attacked them. Acts says, they ran out of the house naked and bleeding and this scared everyone. A bunch of believers brought their witchcraft scrolls and burned them, amounting to 50,000 drachma or 50,000 days labor. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in prayer. After this, the silversmiths in Ephesus started a riot because they were afraid Paul was going to ruin their business selling idols, selling the idols of Artemis, which was true, he was. This riot led to Paul leaving Ephesus in Acts 20 verse 1. It's good news when Paul hears that the people of Ephesus are still loving Jesus and still loving each other. It's huge because there was a huge temptation to either start practicing witchcraft and worshipping Artemis, or to give in under social and economic pressures of the city. Today, we too are going to face temptation after temptation to turn away from Jesus and to stop loving each other. Every day we're told to give up on Jesus. The church is a dying institution full of people who hurt me. There are no, power, no more powerful tools than Satan has than to turn your hearts from loving Jesus or to turn your hearts against a fellow believer. This is why we need prayer. Paul has been praying consistently and regularly for the believers of Ephesus. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, we're told to pray continually. But what does, what does Paul pray for? Paul prays that they would know God through Jesus Christ. And so that's what I'm praying for us, that you may know God Ephesians 1.17 says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know God better, so that you may know him better. Pray, Paul prays for the Father through the Son and the Spirit to give believers a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that they would come to know God better. Acts 6 uses spirit and wisdom to mean the Holy Spirit. And Paul is praying for the believers to know Christ by being filled with the Holy Spirit, spirit and spirit of wisdom, and by the understanding, by understanding God's word, which is revelation. God speaks to us through the Bible, his word, and through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit illuminates our hearts or helps us hear God speaking to us through his word. Notice that we need both the Holy Spirit and the Bible. It's just, if, if we just have the Bible without the Holy Spirit, we won't understand it. And if we think we have the Spirit and don't read our Bibles, our conception of God will be warped. And we will not really have the Holy Spirit at all. Our good friend Jim Retty used to have this saying, all Bible and you dry up, all Spirit and you blow up. Bible and spirit together, you grow up. And I really, like, I really like that. It's quite simple, but it keeps us on the right track. And Paul isn't praying for individuals, but for you all. May God give you all the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That means I can hear from God through the church, through preaching, through different groups, etc. God can speak to us through each other as words of encouragement or helping us to keep on the right path with him. He tells us in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, 
Let us consider how we, might, we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching, as God speaks and we listen and respond, we get to know God personally. One of the things we sometimes ask God to do is use me, use us. But God is more interested in knowing us than what we can do for him. Of course, he wants us to do things, and it's good that we want to do things for God. Otherwise, things might never get done. Those rotas would never get filled. Uh, but there are times when he wants, what he wants for us is to sit at the feet like Mary and not be running around busy like Martha. I find that is a real challenge. This is my prayer for you, that you may know God and that you may have hope. Ephesians 1, 18 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the Bible, the heart is the true man or the true woman. It's who you really are at your most real identity. And maybe today we would call the heart your soul or your core, or maybe just you might just say your heart. And although heart in our culture is more about feelings, the heart in the Bible will include feelings, but also your mind and your will, your core identity. And here Paul is praying that their hearts, who they truly are, would be enlightened so that they may know the hope God has called them to. The word for enlightened means to illuminate or shine. Have you ever been in a dark room, maybe asleep in bed when someone turns on the light and you're blinded? And Paul is praying that the light would go on in our hearts and that instead of being blinded, we would really, truly see the hope that we have. And Paul tells us the state of our hearts without Christ in the next chapter. In chapter 2, verse 1, it says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. This means that our hearts were originally blinded by sin. But if you know Christ, you have a new heart. But does your new heart truly see the hope it has? Maybe some of you have an inheritance coming to you so you know what it's like. Or you've had an inheritance, but chances are some of us don't. Imagine your son, or if, your son, if you are the son or daughter of Bill Gates and you know one day you will inherit a vast fortune. You'd look forward to that day, wouldn't you? Yep. Likewise, God has an inheritance he's looking forward to receiving. But God's not looking forward to receiving a bunch of money. He's not looking forward to receiving land or family business. In fact, God already owns everything. What God is looking forward to inheriting is us. It's you, it's me. Verse 18 says, his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And God's inheritance is, in, is found in us. That means one of the things God is most looking forward to receiving is you and me. He wants to spend eternity with us. And I don't know about you, but I think that sounds really exciting. And whatever you feel like today, the Bible says we are God's treasure. It, has, it says that we are incredibly valuable and precious in God's eyes, and we are his glorious inheritance. And again, this is my prayer for you, that you may know God, that you may have hope, and that you may know the Father's power. Ephesians 1, 19 to 23 says, I pray that you may know the Father's un uncomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to, he, to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. My prayer for you is that you would know just how powerful our Heavenly Father is, his power is surpassingly great. It's incomparable. It's beyond measure and words. And yet we catch a glimpse of just how much powerful our Heavenly Father is 
in what he has done for Jesus. The Father raised Jesus from the dead. Look at the resurrection. Look how Father not only raised Jesus from the dead, but raised him up to the heavenly places and seated him on a throne. <clears throat> That's called the ascension. And did you know that you have access to the resurrection power and the ascension power? What is resurrection power? Resurrection power is believing God can save my family members, my friends, no matter how far from God they seem. Resurrection power is believing God can give me the hope I need to keep going in depression or hard times. Resurrection power is believing God can heal any, situ any situation that seems impossible. Resurrection power is believing God can save relationships that seem to be lost. And resurrection power is believing God can rescue me from my addictions, whatever they may be. And resurrection power is believing God will one day raise me from the grave. If our Heavenly Father can raise Jesus from the grave, is there anything he can't do? What is ascension power? Ascension power is believing Jesus is ruling supreme over all reality on the throne. Ascension power is believing Jesus is bigger than your scariest demons or nightmares. Ascension power is recognizing I don't have to be afraid of what's going on in our country or the world. Ascension power is knowing my future is secure because Jesus has it in the palm of his hands. You have access to Jesus' power if you have confessed your sin, put your faith in him and received his resurrection as your own. If you believe in Jesus' death, resurrection and ascension and you want to know him, then you have access but so often we forget about God's power. We don't use it. Paul says, this is my prayer for you, that you may know God, that you may have hope, and that you may know the Father's power. And I want to end today's message by praying this for us, by praying this prayer for our church. And I want to encourage the, you this week to include Paul's prayer in your prayers Pray that you and your family and friends would know God, have hope, and know the Father's power. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, help us to know you. Help us to know you through your Holy Spirit and your word. Would you light up your word in our hearts so that we love it, and so that when we read it, we hear you speaking to us? Would you light up our hearts so that we encounter you, we want to obey you, but first we want to be in relationship with you. Would you give us hope? Would you give our church body hope? Father, it's really tough when things come against us and when we don't see your hand at work in our church or in our lives and life feels overwhelming. In these moments, would you remind us of the hope we have in you? Remind us of how we are your inheritance. You can't wait to spend eternity with us. We're that valuable and precious in your eyes. Heavenly Father, would we know your power? Would we experience resurrection power in our own lives as you forgive us of our sins and raise us from spiritual death? Would we see resurrection power all around us as you bring people to a saving relationship with Jesus, especially those people who, have given up, who we've given up on? Would we see resurrection, resurrection power in your world and neighbourhood as they are transformed by you? Would we see ascension power as we remember Jesus reigns supreme and has all things under control? Heavenly Father, may we know you, may we have hope, and may we, may we know your power. Amen. <clears throat>